prizes, which is extraordinarily rare. Several other prizes. Uh, he was named many uh, several years ago. He was named uh, Field and Stream Magazine's conservation editor, where he's been given a national audience for his work, which continues to inform uh, thousands of readers all the time. He left the newspaper a few years ago, and he currently is working for the Lens, a New Orleans-based nonprofit newsroom that specializes in investigative journalism, the type that just isn't being done enough today. So he is probably the he is the leading journalist covering uh, Louisiana's long-standing coastal erosion problems and one of the foremost experts on the topic. And another expert who is here tonight is his wife Murray, who joined us from New Orleans. <laughs> so I thank you all for coming out, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Bob Marshall. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. You read it just like I wrote it. Um, let me see if this is going to work. So, uh, that's my wife's workplace. Marie has a business called Louisiana Lost Lands Environmental Tours. And um, she takes people out, educates them, and takes them out by kayak into swamps. And sometimes they come back. Um, <laughs> so, um, Sorry about this, I'm starting a little slow here. I am from New Orleans, and um, let's see, it's a different computer here. Let's see. Do they have computers in New Orleans? Uh, they just got them. They say this internet thing is going to be around for a while. Um, oh, here, right here. I got it. Good. So I'm from New Orleans, and how many people have been in New Orleans? Wow, I don't have to talk. I can just get back down here then. So you know why you went there. You went there because of the music, right? The culture's party town USA, Mardi Gras. Music, damn for the music, right? The food, we have great food. We had great food here tonight, Mardi Gras. I mean, a Louisiana theme. Party town, that's what people think when they think of my city in southern Louisiana and the Cajun culture. They think about having a good time. That's what this means. Les les boutons roulés, let the good times roll. That is our official motto of the city and the area. And it's all it's all play no work oh for most goodness. of the people. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they, they play so hard that they have to leave town. Uh, if you see this guy, uh, please let me know. He's working in at least 20 bars in New Orleans for unpaid tasks. It's true. But what people don't know about South Louisiana is that it's the scene of one of the worst ongoing environmental disasters in the history of this country. And it is a scene of what is fast approaching one of the great economic crises that will face this country. And that's what we'll talk about tonight. Uh, you may have heard we have a wetlands problem in southeast Louisiana. How many people know that, have heard about it, read about it? Okay. So this is a USGS, U.S. Geological Survey of South Louisiana, southeast Louisiana specifically. And it's a, it's a data map, different ground covers, give off different signals and they have different colors. And when you look at a map of Southeast Louisiana, that's normally what you see. So we asked the USGS, or the state did, asked the US Geological Survey, right now let's take off everything that's wet. Just leave everything that's dry. This is where we really live today, in Louisiana, South Louis Southeast Louisiana. Whoops. Um, if you took away the wetlands that are there now, this part of the world would have, oops, doesn't work, uh, would just be two fingers of land sticking out in the Gulf of Mexico. Excuse me. And that's why wetlands are important, because if they're not there, it would be these little speed bumps that wouldn't last very long against hurricanes. So how did this happen? We're going to start the program with, this is from a, a series uh, I did at the time speaking in with a couple of colleagues. It's really a geological history of southeast Louisiana. It's really 
important to understand what's happening here. Whoops. River sediment to build southeast Let me Louisiana. Start again. Sorry about but that. since it took nature roughly 7,000 years and countless tons of Mississippi River sediment to build southeast Louisiana. But since the 1930s, Louisiana has lost over 2,000 square miles of land, primarily because of human intervention. You are about to experience how southeast Louisiana came to be, how it evolved, how it devolved, and what the future holds if action is not taken immediately. The area that became southeast Louisiana evolved radically throughout the ages. The engine of change has primarily been the Mississippi River. We begin this tour of Louisiana's geological history using a map similar to most maps seen today in atlases, depicting a vibrant, healthy-looking, yet deceptive coastline. And we'll explain why most modern maps are deceptive shortly. But for now, we'll travel back in time, 6,000 years. Most of southeast Louisiana did not exist. What would become New Orleans was underwater, just south of the coastline. Lake Pontchartrain was not a lake at all, but primarily dry land carved up by a system of rivers and streams. About 4,600 years ago, glaciers left over from the Ice Age were still melting, and the sea level was rising across the globe, nearing its modern-day elevation. This change sparked the birth of the barrier island known as Pine Island, and a small bay took shape, which would later become Lake Pontchartrain. 300 years later, the Mississippi River changed course toward New Orleans. The Pontchartrain Bay continued to grow as rising sea levels slowed. Pine Island enlarged westward toward the approaching Mississippi River. 4,000 years ago, what's known as the St. Bernard Delta of the Mississippi River nearly connected with Pine Island and closed off Pontchartrain Bay from the Gulf of Mexico. For more than 3,000 years, the mighty Mississippi's St. Bernard Delta dumped river sediment into the shallow Gulf Coast waters, building up land as far east as what's known today as the Chandelure Islands. The Mississippi River is a dynamic land builder. Without its nutrient-rich water, the land starves and disappears. 2,000 years ago, this phenomenon happened when the river changed course again, this time toward present-day Lafouche Parish. During that period, the St. Bernard Delta was being robbed of sediment, which sparked the land loss that left behind the Chandelure Islands. A thousand years ago, the river diverted back toward the east, creating the modern Plaquemines Delta. We we'll take a brief detour here. First, I'm going to stop this bouncing ball here. Um, so, we're going to talk a little bit more about deltas right now, because that's really the essence of this story because all of southeast Louisiana was built by the Mississippi River. And how does that happen? The Mississippi River is the fifth largest by volume river in the world. Uh, and everything between the Appalachians on the east and the Rockies on the west all the way up into Canada, every drop of rain that falls, every flake of snow that melts, they all fall on the surface and they run downhill with elevation into different rivers called tributaries because they contribute to the main flow of this river in this low spot in this part of the continent, the Mississippi. So the red, the white, the Missouri, the Arkansas, the Ohio, the Tennessee, they all are coming across the surface of the land, going downhill with gravity, picking up dirt, basically. And it comes into the Mississippi River, and this huge river, millions of cubic feet per second, it's running downhill as the elevation declines here in the U.S. until it gets on the coastal plain in Louisiana where the landscape flattens out and the river slows down. And in the spring, when the snow is melting and the rains are falling up north, the river comes over its banks. And when that happens, it slows down even further. And when a river slows down, it doesn't have the force to keep carrying all this mud. And that mud starts falling out. It's like a rain of sediment and sand and different organic particles. And that's what happened here as the animation was telling you. And what happens is, is the river will build a delta and it gets so high that there's a force pushing back against the main stem of the river. And the river with gravity behind it is looking for another way 
looking for the area of least resistance, and it cuts off, and it goes in a different direction. They call that, that's when a river abandons its delta. And that's what happened here. It's kind of like if you have a garden hose with a nozzle, and you turn it on full force and put it on your lawn, you'll see the hose kind of snaking back and forth. And that's what a river does on its delta. It just kind of turns back and forth, reacting to gravity and pressure. And so this area here was built over about 7,000 years, this entire part of the country. And actually, if you go down about 400 feet here, or 150 feet below the city of New Orleans, you'll come to Hard Rock, Pleistocene area rock, which is part of a previous delta. So this river's been building deltas here for millions of years. But it's not just the main stem of the river that's building land, and that's flooding. Because when the river gets down here in its coastal plain, instead of having tributaries coming in, you have channels pulling off, and those are called distributaries. And that's an important word because they're distributing the total flow of water and sediment of the main river. This is the Atchafalaya River, which peels off the Mississippi north of Baton Rouge. And these were all, well, they call them bayous now, but other distributaries that came <coughs> off this river in its natural state. So if this is the, the main stem of the river, is the main beating heart of the system, all these are the arteries carrying all this life-giving water, <coughs> fresh water, and sediment. And every year, when the river comes up, it's coming up not just over the main stem down here, but all these distributaries. So when Europeans showed up here in the 1600s, <coughs> this system was like a giant cobweb that stretched from present-day Mississippi almost to Texas. And every year, when the river came up, all these distributaries in the main stem were building land out to the shallow Gulf of Mexico. And it was still doing that at the turn of the last century. <clears throat> in fact, when Bienville founded New Orleans, <coughs> excuse me, this estuary was estimated at 6,000 square miles. This was the Amazon of North America. It was healthy and vital and still growing out. But what happens when you put a levee? Well, a couple things happen, and there are three ways, and this is important to remember, three ways that a coastal delta can maintain its elevation against the sea. The first and most important, of course, are these annual spring floods. That's how it's, every year it comes up, it replenishes. And why does it need to replenish the delta? Because this is a huge, muddy sponge, 400 feet deep, at the mouth of the river, and gravity's pushing down on it all the time. And when a river goes back within its banks, it's like a big weight pressing down on this muddy sponge and very slowly squeezing the water out of it so it begins to subside at a very tiny fractions each year. And then the next year the river comes up and display, puts more sediment all across the delta. It can maintain its elevation. That's the most important way, but there are two other ways. The second way to maintain its elevation is the annual cycle of plant growth. Estuary has lots of plants, grasses, sedges, canes, bushes, shrubs, trees, cypress trees, tupelos trees on the natural levees, the high ground, oak trees, hardwoods. They live, they die, they drop their stems, their branches, their bark, their trunks into the estuary. Botanists call it plant detritus. It's a fancy word for dirt. So a marsh, an estuary can make its own dirt. It can create elevation on its own as long as it's healthy. And these plants are growing and they're dying and they're creating this mixing in with the, set of the mineral sediment, sediment from the river, but on their own they can create this organic soil. And the third way is something called, for lack of a better term, overbank flooding. There's lots of sediment deposited in these natural lakes and bayous and lagoons from the rivers and its tributaries, and there's millions of tons just offshore. So when we have high tides in Louisiana, and a high tide in Louisiana is a two-foot tide, but if we have a storm, a stiff south wind with a high tide, it picks up sediment and that's in here and spreads it around. And just as importantly, when we have hurricanes, they pick up millions of tons of sediment just offshore and spread it back across the delta. So three ways a coastal delta can maintain its elevation, the most important, annual spring floods, second most important is the cycle of plant growth, 
and the third are these high tides and storm tides. So we're going to go back to our little program here. New Orleans was founded in 1718. From the start, levees were constructed to keep the Mississippi River from overtopping its banks and flooding the area as it did nearly every spring. As the city grew, it became lined with man-made canals to control water and transform swamp into neighborhoods. But in order to protect the blossoming city from storms and swollen rivers, more levees had to be built and existing ones had to be raised. By the 1900s, southeast Louisiana began to suffer the consequences of civilization. Most maps you'll find today of Louisiana still depict a 1930s coastline, a deceptive false sense of security. In the 1930s, the lay of the land protecting New Orleans from the Gulf of Mexico was still vast and healthy looking at a glance. But on the surface, trouble was afoot because of levees, man-made waterways, subsidence, saltwater intrusion, invasive species, and sea level rise. So what do you think happens to a delta when you put a levee on a river that crosses through it or builds it? The Mississippi River's springtime floods plagued New Orleans for two centuries until levees protected the city and created stable channels for shipping. But the levees also cut off sediment-rich floodwaters that built the land on which the city sits and that kept alive coastal marshes that helped protect the city from hurricanes. If you go in South Louisiana and look at any levee, stand on any levee there, and look on, they, they call levees the water side and protected side. And there are levees everywhere, right? Because people were afraid of floods, storms. If you stand on that levee and look at the protected side, well, if you look on the water side, the water may still be two feet below you. <clears throat> if it's been there for a couple of decades. On the protected side, you have to look down, sometimes eight to 10 feet. Because when you cut off the water, the hydrology of this delta, what happens? It's not being replenished by the floods. Gravity's pressing down, squeezing that water out. The organics are, are decaying and oxidizing, so everything begins to shrink. It's like a giant sponge that's being dried out, and it compresses and shrinks. Uh, this next sequence is important. Up to this point, the journalist, in this case Dan Swenson, the graphic journalist, was using highway maps. At this point, for the next, the next sequence, he used USGS topographical maps when they were ground truth by surveyors, and after that, <laughs> beginning in the late 40s, they used aerial photography and then satellite photography. So everything he's using now is traced off these photographs and maps. In other words, what you see happen next is a time lapse of 70 years, and it's not an artist's conception. Louisiana is currently losing approximately 24 square miles of wetlands per year which is roughly one football field every 45 minutes. From 1932 to 2000, Louisiana lost nearly 2,000 square miles of land, bringing the Gulf of Mexico uncomfortably closer every day to residents' backyards. From 2004 to 2005, an additional 217 square miles of wetlands was washed away, most of which from Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. If nothing is done to stop the devastating rate of land loss, Geologists predict an additional 700 square miles will disappear by 2020, leaving cities like New Orleans sitting in open water, protected only by the levees that played a major role in sparking the land loss. A couple of quick corrections. This was done in 2007. We're no longer losing 26 to 25 square miles a year. It's down to 16 square miles a year because there's less to lose, primarily. Um, a couple other corrections. Beandel did not show up in a sailing boat. Um, the final New Orleans, they were in a bateau, they were paddling. And that, that football field every 48 minutes is a very popular uh, icon, really, and talks about the Delta, just to make sure. I can't take you out in the marsh and show you a football field disappearing in 48 minutes. That's a cumulative figure. Every blade of grass that we lose from Mississippi to Texas averaged over decades. Sometimes we'll lose 250 miles in one hurricane. And other times we won't have hurricanes for, for years, so that's an average figure. Anyway, this is what we had in 32. Everything in red is gone, and it's not coming back. So, how did this all happen? Here we go. 
Levees. People say, why do we measure everything, the loss of our coast, this 2,000 square miles since the 1930s? Well, that's when the levee system was finished. There have always been levees on the Mississippi River since the Europeans showed up. In fact, by the 1850s, there were about 550 miles of levees from New Orleans to Greenville, Mississippi. But they were locally built, either by the plantation owners or by communities, and they weren't really well built. Um, every now and then would have a big river, and it would just blow through those levees. And the people, at least the white people, the owners would go up on the second story, and when the river went back down, they'd send the slaves out to rebuild these levees. And they just kept doing that for about 300 years because they were making a lot of money. Until 1927, when something happened called the Great Flood of 1927. Uh, John Barry has a great book called uh, Rising Tide. Randy Newman has a great song, Louisiana 1927, all about this. This was, it started raining in the fall of 1926 in the Mississippi River Valley, the drainage really never stopped. And the snow came and it rained some more. The river came up like it never come up before since Europeans were here and it flooded everything from southern Illinois to south Louisiana. 750,000 people were homeless. Hundreds were killed. And Congress told the Corps of Engineers, never let this happen again. Put this monster in a straitjacket. And they did. They <coughs> built the Mississippi River levee system, greatest levee system in the world, and they finished it around 1933. Now, geologists and researchers at LSU and other places tell us that that's all we had done. That was a death sentence for all of southeast Louisiana, putting that levee on the river. But if that's all we had done, subsidence happens at fractions of a second, millimeters a year. The wetlands that were in place in the 30s would still be largely intact today. This is what happens when you starve a delta. This is a satellite shot in southeast Louisiana in the spring. This is all the sediment that used to go here. Here are the sick and dying patient, these wetland basins that are sinking. This is the medicine. It's going off to the Gulf of Mexico where it doesn't do anyone any good. In fact, what it does now is kick off what they call dead zones. You guys have heard about that. This, this water now is heavily uh, loaded with nitrates from fertilizers and from organic material from farm operations and, and urban sewage systems. And it goes out to the Gulf of Mexico in the spring and in May, around May, when the temperature out here gets to about 75 degrees, it kicks off huge algae blooms because algae love organic stuff. And they grow, and when they die, they decompose using oxygen, and it causes hypoxic areas, areas of low oxygen. They're called dead zones because nothing can live there. And in the summer now, this stretches from 5,000 square miles to 6,000 square miles along our coast into Mississippi and Texas. And if you don't have fins, you die. So wait, we've lost 2,000 square miles since the levees went up. But this doesn't make sense because it took 2,000 years for the St. Bernard Delta to get to this shape. So how did we lose, suddenly lose, all this land, so much more land, wetlands, in just 70 years? Well, ironically, about the same time we finished those levees, Oil and gas was discovered in our coastal zone. The coastal zone of Louisiana, the greatest estuary in North America outside of Alaska, the Amazon of North America, is privately owned. 85% of it is privately owned. No one lives there except some subsistence uh, communities, Native Americans, and some Cajun hunters and trappers and market hunters and fishermen. And there are no protections for wetlands. No one down there liked wetlands in the 30s. Wetlands were a problem, it had always been a problem for our <coughs> communities. You couldn't build on them. You had to drain them to build on them. Couldn't grow anything on them. And they bred mosquitoes. And yellow fever had been killing hundreds, sometimes thousands of people every year. So when a Texas company from Houston, which would become Texaco as now Chevron, showed up at a little place called Lafitte, about 25 miles south of New Orleans, as a pelican flies, and told some of the Cajun trappers, we'll give you pennies on an acre for your mineral rights. They said, may we shall. That's a good deal, yeah. <laughs> and so the Texas company, pretty simple, 
Down here by St. Dennis, they would put a barge in there with a bucket dredge in front, push boat behind it, <clears throat> they'd go down to by St. Dennis around here to buy a DuPont <clears throat> until they got to where maybe a straight line to where they wanted to, they thought all the gas was, and they'd dredge a canal. Then they'd come in with another barge and a drilling rig, <clears throat> excuse me, and they would drill, and they were very successful because in about eight years they had 68 producing oil and gas wells in this one area. This, uh, this image is from Project the Lens Div of ProPublica. Uh, their computer text stitched together the wetlands to what they would have looked like in the 1930s based on USGS data. Well, that kicked off an explosion, an oil and gas boom in South Louisiana. Eventually, 50,000 oil and gas wells were drilled in our coastal zone. There wasn't any permitting because it's private land. There are no protections for wetlands, and people were making money. Um, most of these wells were accessed by canals. We don't know how many miles of canals were dredged, because a good permitting system didn't really come into effect until 1972 when we passed the Clean Water Act. So when the nation said wetlands are part of the public trust because they provide important ecological services. You can't destroy them, you need a permit. It didn't say you couldn't dredge, you needed a permit to dredge. We know since then, at least 10,000 miles of canals were dredged for oil and gas, another 550 wider and deeper for shipping. If you go to the state land office in Baton Rouge, like I have done, and look at the older records, the estimate is at least 5,000 miles were dredged before then. These canals were 110, 120 feet wide, 10 to 15 feet deep. This is a coastal estuary. They were connected, and they connected to natural waterways that went to the Gulf of Mexico, which meant saltwater tides were coming into the freshwater parts of these estuaries, killing the plants. The plants' roots that used to hold the banks together are dying. There's no new land, no new sediment coming in from the river because we have levees right on the river. So erosion takes place. Uh, we know from studies at LSU and the USGS and other places that just the dredging, turning this, these places into open water, removed at least 11% of the total land mass in this estuary. So now what are we doing? I've already blocked the annual floods from the Mississippi. Now we're eating into the second most important way of maintaining your elevation the plant base. And this would get a lot worse. But that's not the only thing the canals did, because when you dig a canal, you don't have a canal if you don't remove this, this mud, this soil that nature put down over 7,000 years. They called it spoil because it was of no value. And they stacked it on either side of the canal in what we call spoil levees. 10, 15 yards, 20 yards wide, 5, 10, 15 feet high. If you've got 15,000 miles of canals, you've got 30,000 miles of levees, taking another 30,000 miles strip of the wetlands out of production, this huge weight pressing down on this muddy sponge, causing subsidence. Where, these, where there was lots of drilling and dredging, these levees connected and pounding huge areas, resulting in almost immediate loss and turning it into open water. This is, um, this area was called Lafitte. This is actually called the Bayou St. Dennis area down here when they showed up. By the time I was a teenager, in my 20s and the 70s, we knew it as the Texaco Canals area because I'm going fishing in the Texaco Canals because there were so many canals there. This is what it looked like in 2010. Um, these are the areas where these levy, this is the only thing you see here. It looks like a graveyard with bones, and that's what these spoil banks are, these spoil levees. And these are the areas where they connected and impounded huge areas. So a section of marsh that looked for miles, miles and miles like this, now we're like, are like this, and it's much worse today. It's been six years. This was going on all across the coast. This is Leeville, which is about 45 miles west of New Orleans as the pelican flies. And even as late as the 40s, this was high ground. You know, every watercourse, every river, every creek has a natural levee. 
And that's because when, it, when, they in, when they're in flood, they come up and hit the bank, they slow down, and stuff drops out. So the high ground is right there. The Mississippi River's natural levee in New Orleans is 16 feet above sea level. When the river changed course from the St. Bernard Delta to the Lafouche Delta, it came down by Lafouche. Leeville is down here, close to the Gulf of Mexico. And as late as the 1940s, this was a thriving above ground community. There were cotton fields, there were orange orchards, there were cattle ranches. This is from a, a piece we did with ProPublica. This is, these are actually pictures of the cotton fields down there in 38. These are farmsteads. The oil and gas industry showed up in the 40s, so they're dredging canals. Remember, the land's not being replaced by the river, certainly not by the uh, by, by Lafouche, which has been cut off from the river by the levees. That's a fuzzy picture. That's what it looked like today. And these were the cotton fields. It's all open water. The orange orchards, they're all gone. And in fact, most of these people now have to move north because of flooding. This is Golden Meadow, just north of Leeville. This was solid marsh, that's what's left today. But that's not all we did, because in the 40s, Louisiana taught the world how to drill for oil and gas in deep water. Eventually, we planted 4,500 rigs off our coast, the largest concentration of offshore oil and gas structures anywhere on the planet. And how do you get that wealth ashore with 50,000 miles of pipelines coming through our coast? And why? because 50% of the nation's refineries are between Baton Rouge and New Orleans and along the coast of Texas, where the other 50% are. This is from the U.S. Geological Survey. It's a data map of the oil and gas infrastructure in South Louisiana. Every one of these red or yellow dots is an oil and gas well. You can see the activity was so intense in some areas, they're just blobs. The blue lines are the major pipelines coming from offshore inshore and transmission points in some cases to these refineries, other places to other states. We know where we had the greatest amount of extraction and dredging, we had the greatest amount of subsidence. That's research from the USGS, Tulane, and LSU. <coughs> we were losing as much as 80 square miles of wetlands a year in the 60s in the 70s. This was exponential, meaning the larger it got, the faster it got even larger. These wetlands have been my, my office and playground and, and to a large degree my church most of my life and places I had known all my life were shrinking and becoming open water. There were whole communities out here. People lived there. Manila Village was a community of Filipino-American fishermen who lived in Bar western side of Barataria Bay. There were some protected by lots of marsh and cypress trees, but as the salt water came in and the delta sank, and the canals were dredged, they lost their protection, and their community was destroyed. I took this picture, this is Big Cat Island, which was on the western, eastern side of Barataria Bay. In the 70s, this was over a mile long and a half mile wide. By 1998, it was about I don't know, 300 yards long and about 150 wide. I was taking that picture from here in my boat. I went back six years later with my GPS and took a picture from the same spot, and that's what it was like. It was gone the next year. I used to have a hunting and fishing camp down here south of, between Bures and Venice. Um, not in 1932, I'm not that old, despite what Carrie says. Um, and this is a map pieced together by, uh, from the USGS data by, in our partnership with ProPublica. This is what it looked like in 32. That's what it looked like in 2006. I can tell you all this is gone now. It used to take me 40 minutes to get to my camp from Buras. And I would go through, even then, in 1981, I would go through miles of cane and marsh and some cypress here on Dry Cypress Bayou. Lots of marsh. We'd go fishing in all these different bays. I used to call it fishing in the land it used to be, because I'd be out there fishing and it would be in Bay Pondora, Bay Tambor, or someplace, and someone would say, where are we? Well, this is, this is Bay Tambor, and they'd say, it's just open water. And my, the map on my GPS would show marsh, and it was gone. In fact, three years ago, the U.S., I mean, NOAA, 
took 33 place names off the charts there because they just don't exist anymore. According to the USGS, 36% of the lost whip suckers is directly from these canals at oil and gas work. Direct and indirect impact of oil and gas is around 60%, except in some areas like Lafitte and Leeville and Golden Meadows, it's like 90% because of the activity was so severe. By the way, the permits for these canals required the companies that dredged them to return these wetlands into the condition they found them. In other words, they had to put, refill these canals and mitigate the damage, rebuild those wetlands, not somewhere else there. They never did it. Neither the federal government nor the state of Louisiana has ever forced them to. Lawsuits filed to get them to do that have been killed retroactively by our previous governor. Those actions are still in federal and state court. But that's not the only problem we have. There's more bad news. <laughs> now we have something called global warming. Pretty simple idea. The science is conclusive. Man's putting lots of carbon and emissions up into the air. The atmosphere is getting warmer. The oceans absorb most of that. They've been doing that since the 1800s. And now there's a response. What happens to water when you warm it? It expands. What happens to water stored as ice on land? When it's heated, it melts. That flows into the ocean that's already expanding. So we have sea level rise, the most visible component of climate change. If you go online to sea levels, NOAA sea levels online, one way we measure sea level rise, tide stations. If you've been keeping high tide data every day for decades or a century, and you apply each one of those findings on a chart, you might see a trend, and that's what these things will show you. You can go to any port in the country, and all around the world for that matter, and you'll see this average has been about 9.24, 9.14 millimeters, I'm sorry, 2.24 millimeters a year for most of the country, except down here in South Louisiana. 